Why is farming so hard? Why is it difficult for modern people to grow their own food and to be self-sufficient? And what can you do about it? Hey, I'm Justin Hitt with Prosperity Homestead. I have a confession to make that the timing of crops and the timing of farm activities is my my uh, deadly, uh, my 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 kryptonite, I should say. Uh, essentially, I, my timing on getting things tilled and getting things um, planted is not good at all. Now, I tend to use a method where I'll sow one-third of the seeds early, one-third of the seeds on time, and one-third of the seeds afterwards. And I found that it wasn't quite my timing that was the problem, as it was the weather. And then when I think about the weather, it's the soil. Then I think, basically what my point is, is that you go down this rabbit hole of blame in the farming world because the modern human just isn't familiar with where their food comes from. They aren't familiar with the cycles and seasons. They aren't as comfortable with how the environment will change. And that's why a lot of people today will blame it being too hot or too cold on climate change. They'll be angry because their vegetables are not the ones that they want at the market because those things are not in season. They'll be frustrated because they'll plant a whole field of something and nothing happens. Um, They'll resort to methods such as uh, following moon cycles or uh, wives' tales type things. Now, I'm not saying those methods are not valid because there is such a thing as a harvest moon, Um, but you'll find on the back of every seed packet the germination temperatures – the uh, soil type, and you'll also find the uh, the germination period. How long does it take to germinate? How long does it take to get to maturity? If you're not sitting down and charting all these things out and, and putting them in a plan, then you're kind of hit and miss. Now, the method I, I described where you put a third of the seed in before the harvest date, a third on the harvest date, and a third after the harvest date uh, requires that you have a large enough space to do this. Uh, You can use a greenhouse, for example, to start the plants out, but you still need to know when those seeds need to go into the trays so that they're in the trays long enough in order to germinate and to make plants. So without some kind of written schedule, you will make mistakes. The the bigger challenge, the fourth dimensional thing is time, by the way. Um, The bigger challenge is, in this case, we have a a paddock that needs to be tilled. Now, uh, we talk about no-till. We talk about uh, shallow tillage, and then we talk about natural uh, gardening. Um, so we will only deep till a bed when it's initially constructed. So for example, these uh, earthwork terraces, you'll see them on the YouTube channel. Um, they have a big flat top on them where previously we had individual raised beds in that as this demonstration progresses to the uh, broad acre, um, the broad acre, you can have a big flat level area. Um, that's going to be tilled in uh, so that we can put cover crops on it. But then after those cover crops come up, we're going to flail mow the, the tops. And then we may do a shallow tillage. We may drill right into the flail mowed materials uh, because being that it's so level, it's easier to flail mow down to like a quarter inch. So you can flail mow down to a quarter inch, and that's enough. Uh, if you let it grow, I'm always using knee high and hip high. You know, I'm sure everybody's different heights, but if you let the cover crop grow knee high, and then you flail mow it, while it has growing season remaining, it'll grow back. But once you flail mow it really, really short, and there's no more growing season, it the the mulch material will kill off the roots, and so now you have a root kill. And then when you go to plant starts, you can go rake that aside. And then plant your starts in it and then use the raked materials to kind of mulch around your starts. If you're going to be seeding, then you do have to use some shallow tillage in order to just break up the surface. Now, you wouldn't necessarily use uh, tiller tines to break it up uh, by going deep into the soil. You could use the tines maybe at like an inch uh, just to to rip the surface material off so that it's smooth enough to use a, a seeder. Um, or you could use, uh, there's a couple devices that just twist the soil on the surface. They don't actually dig up any soil. They just twist the uh, cover crop out and uh, leave you a prepared area that you can then seed. 
Um, the reason I'm telling you this is because if you don't know the sequence for farming or the sequence for growing, you're going to just grab the plants when they're available at Lowe's, not understanding that Lowe's puts plants out before the frost so that you buy the plants, take them home, and they get killed in the frost, and then you come out and buy more. Uh, you didn't know that, did you? Um, th- they put plants out because they don't really, you, nobody really knows exactly when the frost is going to come. They're not likely doing that on purpose. But if you have mapped out in the last couple of years when the frost came, you can then plant some seed outside that don't mind the frost while you're planting uh, plants in your greenhouse, protecting them from the frost, and then ultimately getting those plants out in sequence. So again, I just described planting seed for some plants out in the garden and the same seed in a greenhouse so that you can plant out in cycles and then you'll be more likely to catch the optimal time. Because the difference between a week um, as far as plant in the ground uh, can be a significant harvest. Um, So it is something I'm working on and I use schedules and it doesn't really take any fancy schedule. You can literally make a list of the seeds you're going to plant out and then when it should go in the greenhouse if you're planting it to a start and when should it go out in the field if you're going to plant it uh, seed it directly in the ground and the same goes for cover crops which cover crop combination so we have a, a, a paddock it's probably a thousand square foot paddock uh, that was just constructed and it's been raining so i can't till or even rake out and level the soil um, in the rain uh, and but we're almost at the point where even if i did till it and lay it out our pigeon pea or some of the cover crop is not even going to germinate so why waste the seed clover will still germinate winter wheat might still germinate but we're not going to get a lot of production out of it so we might just seed the field throw some st- straw on it and then let it go with what it's got and then early spring that field would become another cover crop it wouldn't become uh, it wouldn't if it doesn't get a whole season of cover crop on it we kind of like to um, let it get a whole season to build that root mass under the soil so again our timelines are important now if you are going to follow a system such as uh, the moon phases and you're going to align your plants to moon phases which the moon um, does impact our hydrology cycles it impacts our weather uh, and it is a good indicator but there's a little bit of mumbo jumbo around that. Uh, we won't go into it here. But whatever method you're going to use, try to be consistent with that method. So soil temperature is a really important aspect. If you have a large garden, you could have different soil temperature profiles in different areas of your garden. You could have microclimates that warm up faster than other areas. You might have areas that stay cool. You want to make sure you know where these areas are so you'd have a map of the garden and you'd map out areas by temperature. And then on the next page, maybe you got a three-ring binder. On the next page, you'd have the same map, but then you'd map out by sun. So at different times of the year, where is the sun located on the garden space? And then on the next page, you'd have the same garden layout with maybe your crop rotation. And then on the next page, now I know what you're saying, You thought farmers were simple. You didn't know farmers used all this technology. Well, yes, you're going to have a three-ring binder with a map of your garden and different aspects of the inputs to good quality seed production, good quality plant production. Then you're going to have your list of plants that are going in and their target dates for both greenhouse and for in the field now if you tend to plant so for example corn uh, we have a, a, a one of those wheelie seeder things that can seed corn we don't need to plant corn in, in uh, starts uh, which some people do by the way if you have a smaller garden you can plant corn in trays and then put out the plugs in the garden and get great corn and that same area that is going to receive those plugs could be finishing off some other plant uh, such as uh, peas for example which is a uh, nitrogen fixing and then you have your corn squash and pea and and the new peas for that season uh, going out as plant starts and then now you've optimized the space but if you've got 125 foot rows of corn and you've got uh you know like uh, an eighth of an acre of corn uh, you're not gonna go put out plant starts unless you got an automatic seeder 
or automatic machine that drops the, the plugs in the, in the soil. You're more likely to put out seed. So you're going to have the field corn or whatever corn you're putting out in the field on a separate sheet with the dates it needs to go into the ground. And then it might not be on the list for the greenhouse. So what I think I'm advocating here, and I, I hope you're hearing it, is that there's going to be some kind of master plan, some kind of binder. There's going to be a farm journal. The farm journal is going to keep track of what you actually do, while the plan shows what you like to do. Because Lord knows I'm supposed to be out there tilling uh, this new uh, grow area, and it's raining, and you can't till in the rain. It'll compact the soil, it'll gum up your machine, and it will just be a muddy mess. Um, but I do know that we're past the point that some of these cover crops will will grow, so why put out the seed? Uh, we could seed the field while it's raining, throw straw on it while it's raining, and then at least have something growing on it, and then till it later. So there's the sequence of planting, there's the sequence of preparation, there's the sequence of harvesting, there's a sequence when it comes to intercropping. Uh, I don't know if you remember some of the videos where I showed you the, the biomass that we were growing. Um, that biomass really ought to be flailed out or cut down or or cut for the animals before it goes to seed. And so there's even the plant growth cycles that you need to be aware of for uh, growing, harvesting, and seed production. I know, folks, I've thrown an awful lot on you. And when we talk about homesteading skills, um, most homesteaders will pick this up over a couple years. So you're going to be, you're going to have your three ring binder. It's going to have your maps of your garden. You're going to keep it up to date. You might have a design plan for your overall property. You're going to use your farm journal to keep track of what you did each season. And they'll get to be a point where you'll be able to just, you'll know what works. And you'll be standing around with the other farmers saying, well, I think corn's going to be a little bit slow this year, so I'm going to get my crop in a little sooner. And somebody's going to say, oh, no, you're going to get the frost. It'll be a... That's part of how it works. That institutional knowledge that was gained with putting your hands in the soil has been lost on folks that, fr quite frankly, um, can just watch it on TV and feel like they've gotten something. Um, the real fact of the matter is, is that even George Washington had a farm journal somewhere and a farm plan somewhere. And we can see that evidence today. You can do this very simply. Um, it, it doesn't have to be fancy. You don't need software. You don't need anything other than uh, just a keen eye and a calendar. And from this, you're going to grow more. You're going to be more productive. And you're going to have greater stability. And by the way, the climate does change nearly every day. And so you will have times where an early frost will come through and kill everything you've got. Uh, I think last year we had too much rain and a lot of the tomatoes burst. Make note, because as things change, you want to know what's appropriate for your environment. And we want to, and this is the last point I've got here, is a lot of folks, when they're not doing this, they fall for the farm sales guy. So when we get too much rain, they're going to go get plastic and cover their uh, their mounded grow areas. When they get uh, too much sun or, or not enough rain, they're going to go buy irrigation systems and they're going to buy shelters and stuff. The main thing about what we're teaching here at Prosperity Homestead is that we want you investing 100% in working with nature and growing appropriate native plants growing appropriate vegetables, growing appropriate uh, orchards and locations on the property where the, the solar aspect will feed them. And this is going to reduce the amount of work you have in the future. If you end up with a tractor and 50 implements and half of them don't work half the time and you end up with uh, a lot of equipment and a lot of accessory equipment, it's just going to be a lot of time moving that crap around. Uh, most of the subscribers to Prosperity Homestead have... 20 to 100 acres we recently did a survey on the youtube channel and if you've got a garden that's two and a half acres it's 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 better to run it as a business as a farm business than it is just to wing it otherwise you're going to spend a lot of money on seed and you're going to have a lot of waste and it's not going to produce well enough and then you're going to resort to fertilizers chemicals 
uh, deep tillage, all the things that you see the commercial business is telling you is necessary. Well, the truth of it is, is you can grow a natural system with minimal tillage or none with the right approach. If you harvest at the right time, if you uh, chop and drop at the right time, if you are bringing in nutrients from other systems, such as your animal systems or composting systems, uh, you will have an organic, a healthy, and quite frankly, a very productive growing area on your small farm, homestead, or estate. You'll get a rhythm going uh, with the nature of your local environment and with the particular growing site where you'll be able to get those plants in the ground at the appropriate times, at the appropriate pace, and they will flourish. You don't need the harsh chemicals. You don't need the pesticides, the herbicides. You don't need the fancy equipment. You can get away, uh, depending on the growing size, um, with minimal equipment and maximum growth. I'm Justin Hitt with Prosperity Homestead. When you have questions, please visit www.prosperityhomestead.org. Go to the contact page. Ask your questions. I'll be happy to include them in a podcast as well as create additional materials to help demonstrate these factors. Um, and again, if you, if you want a farm journal, it, it's just a notebook. You don't have to buy any special farm journal. And uh, literally, you can print out calendars from the Internet, and you can ultimately uh, get a binder from any place that sells children's office supplies. That's where you start. That's where you start. I know there's probably going to be ads on this one day that are for farm management software, but um, if, if George Washington can manage these giant fields and stuff and teams of people that are out there working with pen and paper, then I think you can too. And plus, you can sit out on the front porch with a cup of coffee and read your book and write your little journal, and it's better for your lifestyle. Anyway, visit us at www.prosperityhomestead.org where we help landowners transform their land into maximum utility value. In fact, create a lifestyle that others will, uh, will be envious of and they'll think it's so easy to do, <laughs> yet they wouldn't understand that you, under- that you know the foundations of homesteading. You know the foundations of small farm or managing an estate. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the next podcast.